I, it just, it just firmly rooted my feelings about let these kids have time away from a screen to develop confidence, self-worth, relationships, soft skills, because the more they're staring at a screen, the less they're staring at people, the less they're doing, you know, spending hundreds and hundreds of hours a month on, on a screen is not good for you. Welcome to Brainstoke. My name is Tom Telford here with Preston Niederhauser. We're excited today. We have a special guest who is going to teach us all about doing and becoming and facing the struggle to find the stoke. Chad Willardson, welcome. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you, Chad. You know, um, you're accomplished in a lot of ways. Um, you, you have a financial podcast. You, you're an author. Um, but I wanted to ta start talking about you and your personal journey on when you decided you needed to become fit. Mm. And I, when did that change for you that you knew you needed to um, improve your own personal health and why you felt like that was really important at this stage of your life? Yeah, good question. I, uh, and to, to, to set the record straight, I was fit for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't my first time getting fit. Uh, but the book Fit for Wealth starts off in, in a fun story at the 27th floor of a Denver Hyatt downtown hotel at a reception party with some colleagues of mine. And there were some people actually at the table who recognized me from LinkedIn and they were asking questions. And one of them said, hey, when are you going to write your next book? I love your books. And I said, oh, thank you. And I said it. I don't know. It's, I got to start soon because I usually have the same track of when I publish books. And, and they said, well, what's it going to be about? And I said, it's probably going to be about the correlation between health and wealth and how health and wealth and fitness and all this stuff go together. And as I'm saying that, I'm, I'm eating a co uh, like a bacon cheeseburger with dripping barbecue sauce. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's like 1130 at night. And my generous, kind friend, colleagues who work work for me with their colleagues, team members, they kind of started giving me a hard time and were laughing. And um, that triggered something. I was like, all right, I, I think I need to, uh, I need to slap myself back into shape that I was a, a year or two prior. So that was just, I think, you know, you don't change, you don't make changes until you're really disgusted with yourself a little bit. Yeah. And you, you hit that wall of like, I need to do something and I'm not going to keep waiting till the next day. Yeah. You know, I, I can relate. I, um, had, I recently lost about 50 pounds as well. Um, Whoa. over the last, it's been about the last two, guess you're last not two as years. Tall as me, so that's even more. <laughs> Five ten. Um, okay, yeah. but, uh, yeah, it reached a point where I was truly, I was so frustrated and discouraged and disgusted. And I had a great network of people around me to, to help me stay motivated um, so maybe what are some of the key things that you found or used that helped you th to, to really get going besides being disgusted? Yeah, just dis discipline and tracking uh, outside support, experts, technology, um, accountability, those things really helped me. You know, I have some of that I have to report my workouts to and keep track of what I was eating. So that that's something that I had never done. You know, I had trainers off and on or did things off and on, but I'd never been like super consistent where yeah. I was weighing myself and taking pictures and logging in what I was eating and what I, every single rep of a workout. And suddenly it was like I had to report these things and that really supported my goals. And when I first told him, I said, hey, I want to lose. Um, I'd like to lose 50 pounds. And he was like, that's a lot to lose in the year. Um, you don't have. He didn't think I had that much to lose overall, but, but I think I threw him for a loop when I said, um, no, I want to lose that in like the next 90 days. <laughs> and he was like, Whoa, hold on, hold on like that. Sorry, man. I said, look, you just tell me how and leave the discipline part up to me. So I said, I don't know how 
I've never done this, but if you tell me exactly what I have to do, I will do it every single day and let's see what happens. And I didn't, I wasn't perfect at it. I ended up, I think losing 44, 45 pounds by the time the 90 day mark hit, but I felt like a different person as I'm sure you do. Yep. And it just, it gave me that confidence in the structure and the system that like, Oh, this, this works. You know, you just have to consistently do it. Yeah, I can, I can totally relate, I guess. And the next thought is what did that do for your, your mental well being? Once you, once you accomplish 44 pounds, it's a huge boost to mental health when your body is physically healthy, when you're moving, when you're hydrated, when you sleep, you make better decisions, you have more confidence, you see things more gratefully. I really believe that a lot of our mental health struggles actually stem from poor physical health. We're eating processed foods, we're not moving, we're indoors, we're looking at screens, we're underslept, and we've got too much information coming in, not enough rest and self-care, and therefore, we don't, I mean, it's no surprise, we don't feel good about ourselves or we don't feel good about our life because yeah. The, the body that we're living in is being treated like garbage. And then we wonder why our thoughts are impacted by our, or our energy is impacted. Of course, if you don't treat your body well, your thoughts and, and feelings are going to be impacted. Yeah. Chad, it seems like <clears throat> in the process, you know, I, I mentioned that I had Southern California roots as well. Um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I was building a business and at the time got big as well. I remember flying home from Southern California back to Utah, to, you know, for Christmas. And there was a moment where I was reading an, an article in a magazine and it basically said, you know, the prime of your life as a man is 25 to 35. And I remember thinking, I'm, I'm in the worst shape of my life, you know. So I, too, in that moment of disgust was like, I got to drop weight dropped 30 pounds, actually spent a lot of time at Soka University, if you know Soka, the private school, yeah. and, um, and ran a bunch of weight off. And in that process, there, there were two or three key struggles for me. You know, food was one of them. But as you look back, what were the big struggles of weight loss and how are they the same in being an entrepreneur and building businesses and being an investor? I think the struggles typically show up in breaking habits and, and mindsets of the past. I think struggles are necessary for growth and we often want to avoid the struggles or we want to make excuses of why we don't need to go through those. We can kind of take a little pathway around the struggle, but that's not true. You have to actually go straight through the storm and the struggle to get to the end goal. And that's what I found to be true. And for me, it was definitely like, I love to eat, I could eat, I mean, Put me up against anybody i can eat <laughs> some people like appetizers some people just like desserts i like both so i i feel like it's the discipline of those moments of where you're you know you're making progress but then it's easy to say to reward yourself with bad decisions and i don't know why we do that but we we think we deserve bad decisions and we should reward ourselves whether it's money like i'm gonna go splurge i'm gonna buy stuff on a personal credit card i'm gonna reward and treat myself and we make bad decisions and we justify it and then we have to deal with the consequences later. So I, I, I know that as an entrepreneur, it's the same thing. You have to have courageous conversations. You have to go through struggles. You have to look stupid in the short run to look really smart and wise in the long run. And that's just part of the game. One of the things that you said in a podcast that I listened to recently, it, it I, I, I hit pause and I went back and then I did it again and again. And it was confidence comes from keeping commitments to yourself. You know, as you look at your career span now having dropped, you know, the weight that you did recently, when you think about the confidence that came from keeping the commitments, was it the end result or was it along the way your confidence built? Meaning, you know, as you started to see some results and the weight come off, feel a little bit better, is confidence built over time? Confidence is built through simply keeping the promises you made to yourself. So I was, uh, I flew into Arizona for a conference. I got there very late. I was at that point, I was doing two workouts a day. I was doing one in the morning, one at night. And I arrived and it was, 
it was after midnight and I was exhausted. I was also coming down with a cold, I felt like. I didn't even really want to go to the conference, but I had to go. And I showed up, I got to the hotel room and I just sat down on the bed like, whew, I'm going to crash. Like, I got to get up at 7 a.m. for the first breakfast meeting. And I was like, man, I didn't do my second workout. Like, I could push it till tomorrow and try to get up before 7 and do an extra workout. But like, no, I need to just do it now. So I put my AirPods in and I walked down to the fitness center at the hotel. There was no one there. And man, the next morning I woke up with more confidence because I forced myself to do something that was hard. And it's not because I saw results. I believe that as an entrepreneur, you anything that you're doing, you're making efforts. You can invite people to join your business. You can invite people to hire you as a, as a business. You can invite people to work for you and you can't control what they do. But the more invitations and the more swings you take and the more you do things that are hard, scary and uncertain, the more comfortable you get putting yourself in those situations. So I love to put my kids in situations that seem intimidating and just push them out there and let them do things because over time they build so much confidence and now it's like it's incredible so my oldest daughter plays basketball at BYU and she I never ever ever talk to coaches my kids all play at least two to three sports some of them are really really good at sports <laughs> and if there's a problem with a coach I never ever ever talk to them I, I the kid my kid might be complaining about a situation and I say well what are you gonna say to the coach because I'm not getting involved. And so they have built up that confidence to go to the coach and say, hey coach, can I have a meeting? I need to talk to you about something. You know, or I didn't understand this, or why were you yelling at me for this? Or I felt like, you know, this would have been the play call, or I, I, I'm not happy with my playing time, or whatever it might be. They have built that confidence because I forced them into uncomfortable situations instead of coming in and rescuing them as influential dad talks to coach and solves the problem and therefore my kid gets what they want because that doesn't help them in the long run it doesn't build their confidence then they think they have to go to dad to get stuff done and now it's like hey dad guess what i talked to a teacher or a professor or a coach and this is what i shared this is what they shared and we solved it and it's like had i not pushed them to have these uncomfortable conversations as little kids they never would have had it. They would have been very dependent upon me to solve their stuff. And that's why that's how you build confidence, getting outside your comfort zone, keeping your commitments, doing things that are hard. Whether you get the results or not, you're going to you're going to be more comfortable doing hard things in the future. How many how many times? <clears throat> well, this is a pretty general question, but how many times have you failed? And how, how has that now uh, translated into this confidence that you have been able to instill in, in these kids? I fail. I still, I still, I mean, fail or rejected. I say like rejected. I get rejected all the time. Uh, I still get rejected. I can't count the number of times I've been rejected. I went business to business, inviting people to come to lunch seminars and I made, re I made the reservation. I had to put a deposit down. I had no money to even have a, any kind of lunch seminar. And I was borrowing money to put the money on the lunch seminar deposit, made invitations, made cold calls, went business to business. And I'd show up and there was one person and like the table in the ballroom was set for 30 and I was hoping I'd get 35. And there was often times where there was one person and it was humiliating. And I've had those situations my whole life and I still get rejected. It's not like, uh, it's not like it doesn't happen. I applied to be a speaker at BYU education week. And honestly, I looked at the people who'd spoken in the financial space before, and I thought it was kind of a shoe in. I overdid the work on the application and got rejected two years in a row. And I was like, man, and that was recent. <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> I got accepted last month to speak this August. And I'm like, all right, see, I wasn't going to give up on that. <laughs> yeah. But um, like, I still get rejected all the time. If you never get rejected and you're not failing, then you're not trying very hard. Yeah. So my kids can surf really well and they can snow ski really well. And when they're younger and I'm teaching them to surf and ski, I just say, look, 
if you ski today or you surf today and you don't really fall down hard, you're not trying very hard. So I like to celebrate when they fall off the surfboard or when they take, try to take a bigger wave than they're comfortable with and they fall off and maybe they hit the reef or maybe they hit their leg on the board and I celebrate that and they'll get, they're going to get ice cream if they try bigger things. They're going to get some kind of reward. So if you condition them to talk about rejections and failure as a positive experience, then they will be way more comfortable trying stuff when they're older. Yeah, love it. Chad, you talk about, <clears throat> I loved your just your description there because I grew up in financial services as well. You know, I, I built a business over time and sold it a few years ago. But in that process, when I thought, you know, at the, at the time we were selling, as I looked back, you know, there really was a formula that was there. And my formula personally was break neck work, work ethic and plus interpersonal risk. And you just described how much interpersonal risk you've been willing to put out there, you know, that you've been humiliated at times and that you keep coming back for more. When you think about the prime real estate, the three inches between your ears in your mind, walk us through your mindset. Like, what do you believe about yourself, your human potential, how you positively coach yourself through all of this stuff today? How does that inner dialogue go? I believe that I was the kid that always believed I was going to come back and win, even if I was losing by 40. And I think there's something to be said for that. Like, I love my dad. My dad is an amazing business leader. He's retired now. But my dad, if we were down, like if we were at an Angels game and the Angels were down by three runs, I was always saying, like, we got to stay to the bottom of the ninth because we're going to win in the bottom of the ninth. And my dad was always like, we're going to beat the traffic. We got to go home. <laughs> and I was like, no, dad, like, we're going to come back and win this game. We got to stay. We cannot leave because I'm so confident we're going to come back and win. And there are times that we still laugh about because we were in the parking lot when the fireworks went off, when we hit some kind of a game winning grand slam at the end of the game. And I'm just like, I told you we were going to come back. <laughs> and he's just. <laughs> It's still the same running joke in our family because my dad and I would always butt heads about leaving early at the games. And I always just said, we're going to come back and win like we can't leave. And I think that's the mentality that I believe and I, I still have is just like I could lose, I could get rejected, but something is going to come of it positively. And even if we get rejected on a new, a new potential client, like there's one around the corner. And I just always believe that. Yeah. <clears throat> I love it. <laughs> I w I'm just sitting here. So are you an Angels fan versus a Dodgers fan? I'm an, I mean, we grew up, my dad was a Dodgers fan because he grew up in Long Beach. Um, the Angels are right close to us in Orange County. So I love the Dodgers as a kid. Um, my number 55 in sports was because of Oral Hershiser. I loved yeah. Kurt Gibson growing up. But as I got older, like the Angels games were just so close and so easy to get to. Yeah. So we've been season ticket holders for the Angels for probably 20 years. And so I'm more of an Angels fan. I don't like driving all the way out to Chavez Ravine. It's kind of a pain for me. So, so does your heart hurt a little bit that Shohei left? It does. But, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens with all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, he's in, <laughs> he's in a pickle right so, now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I loved him. I, I mean, it, my heart hurts because we don't make the playoffs. Yeah, so yeah, I get it. It's painful, and all my Dodgers friends are always giving me a hard time. But I'm an I'm an OC guy, born and raised. So right on. Yeah, Chad, you've mentioned a little bit about you. You mentioned your daughters at the Y. You know, you've been outspoken online. You you know, you show pictures outside of the church. You know, you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints and outside the temple. You know, I was raised in a household by amazing parents as well. You know, LDS family. And one of the challenges that I grew up with was big vision, right? The potential of us as humans is big. And yet chasing financial success, chasing, you know, big life was almost taboo. You know, it was, it was this kind of hard balance of like, I want to be successful, but I was raised to be humble and to not show it. How do you navigate that? Because it's, I, I see you doing it brilliantly. You do it with grace and giving kind of gratitude for your roots and faith, but it doesn't hold you back. You know, you're, you're all systems go. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. That is a good topic. Um, 
you know, it's interesting because like I don't run Pacific Capital Social Media, the one of my companies. I don't run the social media, and the team, the social media team, did a post yesterday or the day before, and the post was the benefits of owning a private jet, and they had a video of me walking onto my plane, and and, and it was it was nice, it was in good taste. And I immediately call them and I'm like, delete that video, delete that post. Like, I don't make posts about stuff like that. I didn't feel comfortable with it. So I think the idea for me is to focus on trying to bless, not impress. And I, I have big goals. I don't care if I, I know people are going to judge me for being financially successful and from showing some of that success in our travel and stuff. I, I just don't care. Like, cause I'm a good person and I care about people and I donate and I share, I want to bring people up. I want to uplift people and show them what's possible. And so if you resent success and you resent wealth, you're never going to get it yourself. I always believe that to be true. I believe that God wants resources in the hands of good people and not just in the hands of people who are doing bad things or supporting bad causes. So I always just had the feeling like, why not? Why shouldn't I go for, or for big things and then be really generous with success? And so that's, that's been my outlook my whole life is like, there's no judging. I'm friends with anyone. I, I love people at church or different neighborhoods and backgrounds. Like, you know, when we go on trips in my book, Smart Not Spoiled, I talk about it, how we do service stuff as a family. The first day we were in, I don't know where it was. Maybe it was Puerto Rico. Like we did a, we woke up at 3 a.m. and did this massive beachside cleanup and the kids were grumbling. But at the end of it, I was like, you know, you have to work hard and give, give charity to people in need or there will be no privileges. You know, yeah. like we have to do stuff like that. And one time we were in the Bahamas and we did a, our, the, the things that the kids wanted to do was a service, service day at an orphanage during that trip. And the taxi driver was so confused. Like, why would you, why would you pay us lots of money as a taxi driver to drive an hour away to this orphanage, spend time there, may, pay while the, while the guy waited and then drive back home after four hours. The last day of the trip, I was, I asked the kids, like, what do you guys want to do on the last day of the trip? Guess what they said? Back to the you orphanage. want to go back and hang with those kids at the orphanage. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, so you can have resources and do lots of good things like good causes require resources. And I don't have any shame in going for big financial goals because I believe that, like I said, God wants good, good people to do good things. And so I believe that if I'm blessing people and changing lives, then he'll continue to bless us. And so I, there, it's a fine line. Uh, I know it's, it's very tricky. Sometimes I, I try not to be boastful. I'm sure it comes off sometime as boastful, like, look, Chad's traveling again. And people will say stuff, you know, people will say what well, I would never post the, so many pictures of myself on vacation. I'm like, OK, you know, or like, how could you how could you dare show your clients that you were you know, flying in first class? I remember that a few years ago and it was like, you know what? Clients want to take advice from someone they aspire to be like. Yeah. So that's the way I look at it. I, I feel like I can be an example of success who also loves family and God at the same time, rather than someone who hides my faith or hides my success or hides my love of my wife. Like I'd rather just be who I am and hope that people see something good that they can follow. Chad, one of the challenges, I love that by the way, for so many reasons, but you know, in the world that we live in, my wife and I are, we own mental health companies. We're doing this podcast because Preston and I believe that teens today need good examples. They need to know from guys like you, how do I be genuine? If I really do want to have success, how do I do it genuinely? And, and so your, your real factor is part of the reason that we wanted to have you on, that you're just real about it. And I think that that is something that teens are har having a hard time navigating today, just being real about, you know, the, of life. When you think about teens, you know what's going on, obviously, in the world today. You have teens on your own. You have a daughter at the Y. What advice would you give teens today who are trying to navigate things like self-confidence, peer pressure, 
how to deal with the online community, all the pressures that they deal with today. Thoughts? Freestyle. Three of my, yeah, three of my five kids are teenagers, two teenage boys. Uh, I don't give my kids a phone till they're 16. They're the last kids on earth to get phones. Not any phone. Not a texting phone, nothing. And for a while, they hate me for it. In seventh and eighth grade, everyone else has phones, this and that. Their friends have to text me or my wife to get a hold of them to make plans for the weekend when they're 15 and a half years old. And is it embarrassing? I don't really care. Uh, I want my kids to learn social skills, soft skills. I want them to learn not to be addicted to the phone like most of the world is. And I really think that relationships and who you surround yourself with is critical. Like if there are five kids who are going to flunk out of school and you hang out with them, you're going to be the sixth. But if there's five kids who are aiming for growth and success and they've got good goals and they're, they're generous people, you're going to be the sixth. So I attribute a lot of the great things in my life to great friendships, even back when I was in high school. So I tell teenagers to really choose your friends and environments very wisely. You're so easily influenced. Sometimes I'll tell our, my teenagers, like, there are certain things where I say you just this is one of those things where you have to trust my 30 years of experience. Like I was 16, 29 years ago. Take that back. Yes, 29 years ago. <laughs> I just had a birthday. OK, so I tell him, like, look, you got to trust me. I've been through this situation and I can see a little bit a little bit further along than you can. And I know you're not going to understand this one, but this is one of those where I got to step in and say no. And so teenagers listen to the adults that really care about you and have your best interests because they can see stuff beyond that you can see. And when you grow up, you're going to realize like, oh, they did kind of have better insight perspective than I thought. I thought my parents that are these leaders or these mentors didn't understand me, but actually they really did. And they did have a good sense for what I'm going through. How does this so, same... Uh, sorry, finish that no, thought. Sorry. Go ahead. No, go no, ahead. I, I was just thinking, how does that uh, impact their self-worth? Your, How does your philosophy and what you've taught your kids impact their self-worth? You know, my daughter, for a while, she was our first. And my, I was fighting this battle alone because my wife said she needs a phone. How can we get a hold of her? You know, what about coordinating carpool and this and that? And I was the, I was like the last man standing saying no. And so I was the bad guy. And then once I did it for her, I said, it's going to happen for all our kids to be consistent. And what's crazy is after a year, year and a half, she was in eighth grade and came home one day. And I was like, how was school? And she said, it was really sad. Middle school, eighth grade. And I said, why? She said, because at lunch, I wanted to talk to all my friends. And none of them looked up once. Mm. The entire lunch table everyone was looking down at their phone and they had their, their headphones in or they were just looking at the screens. No one talked to anyone the whole recess and the whole lunch. And she's, I said, so what did you do? She's like, I went to one of the lady counselor teachers who was standing by the basketball court and I just went and talked to her and shot some hoops with her because none of the kids did anything. And it was like, wow, okay, so she's recognizing what, what issues we avoided by just not giving in to peer pressure. And after that, I went on to speak. I went on some speaking engagements with Colin Karchner. I don't know if you know that name, Save the Kids Foundation. So yep. Colin and I toured around a little bit and spoke together just about mental health of teenagers and social media and phone addictions and things like that. And uh, I, it just it just firmly rooted my feelings about let these kids have time away from a screen to develop confidence, self-worth, relationships, soft skills, because the more they're staring at a screen, the less they're staring at people, the less they're doing, you know, spending hundreds and hundreds of hours a month on, on a screen is not good for you. <clears throat> Chad, one of the things that I told my kids when they were growing up is there's going to come a time when if you can look somebody in the eye and communicate verbally, you're going to be the wealthiest people in society. You know, as we, you know, one of the things that you mentioned um, in a podcast, I know this year, your focus was time management. So we know we're, we've got, you know, only a few minutes left with you, but 
maybe as the as the time runs out, speak to that a little bit about maybe just the skills that you're seeing, you know, in really talented and successful young entrepreneurs growing up. What are you seeing out there in young talent where you're like, man, they he or she has it together. They're really going to do well because of X. Communication skills are number one. No matter what you do for work, what line of industry you're in, it's your communication skills that will either propel you up or keep you down. And with AI and technology, almost anything can be learned immediately or produced or written. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. To me, I think school has to change the way school system is set up in America. Like it doesn't make any sense anymore to study facts and take a test on facts. It makes no sense to me at all. So they're going to have to change how people teach and learn. And to me, the number one skill will be to really just communicate with others because regardless, regardless of what technology is out there, if you can communicate well, if you can communicate your idea, if you can communicate concerns, that's going to help you in your personal and your business life, regardless of what else is changing out there in the world that's out of our control. Awesome advice. I think that's so good to just hearing from you, you know, what, what the future looks like for those who can focus on, you know, communication skills. Anything else that's on your mind you want to freestyle about that you're thinking, you know, these are current trends or thoughts that you're having that you would love for other people to be aware of, whether that's a book you're writing or things that you're seeing and doing? Yeah, my next book comes out in, in six weeks, but I would, I would actually be more excited just to share the thought that um, an article I wrote for Entrepreneur Magazine, I think it was last year, but it's, it's called um, something about the hustle culture is a big lie. I don't remember the title of it because it's got to be a year old, but it's about the hustle culture. And I love motivational stuff. I watch motivational videos. I repost them on my Instagram. I watch them on YouTube. I listen to stuff that gets me excited. But I strongly disagree with the pathway that a lot of these hustle gurus tell you that you've got to go through to be successful, which is you've got to give up sleep. You've got to work 100 hours a week. You've got to do this and that where you sacrifice essentially everything around you that matters, your health, your relationships, and I just disagree with that. I chose to be successful while also having good relationships at home, while still paying attention to things that matter to me, like fitness and faith and family. Those things matter to me. So I was never going to, I didn't take some jobs offers that I got out of college that were going to be like, 70 to 90 hours a week for three or four years and it would look really good on my resume i said I, there has to be a different path where i can find a way to be successful and not have to do 80 to 90 hours of just grinding myself into the ground so to me if you can find three things at once you'll be successful one of them is you have to be really good at it number two you really enjoy it and number three people are willing to pay you for it and if you're really good at something and you have fun doing it, you're going to keep learning and growing. You don't get bored of it. And if it's something that's valuable, that solves problems and people are willing to pay for it, then that is something you should go all in on. Uh, people talk about multiple streams of income to get wealthy. I completely disagree with that. That's, that's what you do after you become great at some one thing. So becoming an expert, a specialist, a superstar at something will open up all these other doors. So first focus on being excellent, amazing, outstanding at one particular thing that you love, that you're good at naturally, and that people appreciate, and that eventually you can spread out into other areas. Great amazing. advice. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Mic drop. Well said, Chad. Thank you for being Great. with us today. We appreciate it. You've had your daily dose. <laughs>